Um, so the title of my talk, as you can see today, is the, is the class pay gap in Britain's higher managerial and professional occupation, uh, occupations. And this really lays out analysis um, that I've been conducting with a colleague of mine at LSE, Daniel Lawrison, over the last year or so about social mobility both into and within Britain's most prestigious occupational arenas. Um, and as Jackie says, this is now part of a wider ESRC Future Leaders project, um, which I'll tell you a little bit about as we go along. Um, now, I suppose the genesis of this work really lies in addressing a problem that has hampered uh, British research on social mobility for some time. And that's really that the UK has traditionally lacked a large nationally representative data source able to provide really fine-grained analysis of social mobility. In particular, as I'll go on to explain, this has meant that debates have tended to centre on measuring overall national rates of social mobility within the country. Um, and to my mind, at least, have failed to really address how does social mobility vary according to more specific social groups, in this case, um, high status occupations. Indeed, the UK government has been very much aware of this fact as well. Uh, and after sustained lobbying from myself and lots of other um, academic researchers um, and the Social Mobility Commission, um, the uh, Labour Force Survey, the largest employment survey uh, in the UK, agreed in 2014 uh, to include questions about a person's class origins in the uh, survey. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how you measure that in, in the LFS as we go along, but what I really want to do today is take you through the data that comes from that um, new question um, and really try to provide for the first time really a really fine-grained analysis of, of social mobility into and within these high-status arenas. So there's two research questions um, that I'm going to be answering. First of all, just very simply, is upward mobility more common in some high status occupations than others? And second, what I want to do is sort of move beyond this idea of social mobility as sort of access to occupations and actually examine how do the upwardly mobile fare once they're actually within these occupational settings and specifically, um, do, they, do the socially mobile attain the same levels of earnings as those from more privileged backgrounds? And if not, can we explain the difference uh, between the two groups? Um, or does a class ceiling um, persist when we compare otherwise similar people from different class backgrounds? Now, before we move on to the data, I just want to give you some sort of brief context about where these questions come from uh, and why uh, we think they're important. Now, you'll have noticed over the last 20 years or so in the UK context, the goal of increasing social mobility has really become a rare point of convergence among all Britain's main political parties. And I suppose that's because social mobility has really been come to be seen as sort of one of the primary indicators of a fair and just society. Um, a powerful metric that tells us about the openness uh, of our meritocracy. Now, British sociologists have been intimately, uh, intimately connected uh, to this political agenda with most research on social mobility, as I mentioned, following the lead of John Goldthorpe in measuring overall national rates of social mobility into what are called the big social classes um, of what's called the National Statistics Socioeconomic Classification, the NSSEC. Um, and what that really means, I suppose, is that we have a really large body of data and analysis on mobility into these large categories of occupations, into these big social classes. Um, but it also means that we might be missing, through doing that sort of work, uh, differences in mobility between individual occupations, particularly elite occupations. Now, the question of how to develop a more occupationally specific analysis has been advanced in the US, particularly by the work of David Grusky and his colleagues. Uh, in what's known as the micro-class thesis, uh, Grusky and colleagues have argued that there are actually distinctive differences in social mobility um, between individual occupational groups, particularly 
when you look at the greater probability that children will actually follow directly in their parents' footsteps. Okay, so children of doctors becoming doctors. This is this idea of micro-class reproduction. But one problem with the micro-class approach, however, is that like big-class analysis, it tends to be remain tied to what are called mobility tables. Okay, it tracks identical origins to identical destinations. And for us, this means it sort of elides the fact uh, or the question of how, how does your big class origin affect your micro class uh, destination? Um, or in slightly less abstract terms, uh, if a micro class perspective might capture the specialized resources that a doctor may transmit uh, that will advantage their child in the field of medicine, we still think it's important to ask what kinds of resources come from that parent's big class position, okay? Their more general position of privilege in society um, and how that may then affect their children's particular occupational destination. So when this new LFS data um, was released, which allowing us really for the first time to ask exactly this kind of question, uh, Daniel and I, uh, as you can imagine, sort of jumped on the opportunity um, to do the analysis. Now, <clears throat> another sort of byproduct of the dominant focus on social mobility rates is that it tends to reduce the conversation around social mobility um, to the issue of occupational admission. Okay, who gets into the top jobs? But while, of course, entry is important, getting in doesn't necessarily mean getting on. And in this way, most research on social mobility, we believe, fails to really address the linger of a person's class origin, okay? And how that linger might affect outcomes actually far beyond occupational entry. Now, of course, this issue of occupational success has, of course, been much explored very fruitfully in relation to gender and ethnicity, with research consistently demonstrating the pay gaps, um, the glass ceilings, faced by women and ethnic minorities uh, in top occupations. So I suppose our paper here is really trying to follow this logic uh, to advance uh, a new way of conducting mobility research, one that draws upon this concept, um, this feminist concept of a glass ceiling, to really interrogate whether beyond entry do the socially mobile face hidden barriers within Britain's uh, top occupations. So. Um, I hope you can see these slides. I know they're a little bit dark. Um, please do sort of ask if there are things that come up from the data that you can't read or that you can't understand. Um, just to tell you a little bit about our approach here, um, we're specifically looking at people in 63 individual occupations that fall into class one of the NSEC. Okay, which is defined as higher managerial, professional and administrative occupations. And what we do, as you'll see when we go on, is break those, uh, this group down into sort of 15 or 16 occupational groups. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we came up with those groups. Um, it's also worth saying we're restricting our analysis here to those between 23 and 69 and not in full-time education. And this gives us a final sample within the um, LFS of um, around three and a half thousand people who have all of the variables we need for our analysis. Okay, they're in NSEC. One, they also have origin data and they also have income data. One last bit of context before I actually get to the results for you. Um, very importantly, um, how are we sort of conceptualizing social mobility um, in this analysis? Um, so to measure social, to measure class origin, um, we're referring here to this new LFS question, and that asks respond respondents, what did your main parental earner do when you were 14 years of age? Okay, now based on these answers, we group our respondents into four categories, okay, and they are colour-coded here, so you should hopefully be able to follow them as we go along in the analysis. So those with higher managerial and professional parents, okay, within NSEC 1, um, we call in most of this analysis the intergenerationally stable, or the stable for short. Those who have lower managerial and professional parents, okay, teachers, nurses, etc., 
Um, they're in yellow, and we're calling them here the short-range upwardly socially mobile. Uh, those with NSX 3, 4, and 5 parents, okay, these are people doing things like office management, um, technicians of certain kinds. Um, we could define them as the mid-range upwardly mobile. And then those whose parents did work that is characterised as NSX 6, 7, and 8, which is traditionally your sort of working class employment in the UK, okay, cleaners, labourers, uh, and those who didn't work, etc. just to give you some examples. And we're calling them the long-range upwardly mobile. So let's just start our analysis by looking at how different class backgrounds affect access into elite occupations. Uh, and this chart basically tells you how the social origins of those in different higher and professional managerial jobs on the right compare to the backgrounds of the population as a whole. Okay? And what you can see very clearly is that those from advantaged backgrounds, okay, in red, uh, are very significantly overrepresented in the top jobs. Okay? This is something like 28%. And this is something like 14% in terms of the overall population. And just to show you this, perhaps in a slightly more intuitive way, this is the same data, but telling you how overrepresented or underrepresented people from certain backgrounds are in the top, in top jobs. Okay, so if all class backgrounds were equally uh, represented, this all of these bars would be one. Um, but what you can see very clearly is that those from higher managerial or professional backgrounds are nearly two times more likely to be found in NSEC 1 jobs uh, than in the general population. So probably not news to any of you, um, but clear evidence here of the continuing reproduction uh, of privilege in the UK. Um, Next, though, what we wanted to do was look actually within NSEC 1, okay, to see how open or how closed are 16 particular occupational groups. Okay, now half of these groups, things like medicine, law, academia, which you can see from the board there, engineering, um, these can sort of be conceptualized as what David Grusky calls micro classes. Um, others, we group sort of in a more ad hoc way, um, in ways that we think are about as coherent as they possibly can be, but they are slightly less sort of easy to characterise. Um, just a couple of things to note from this board. I'm not sure if you can read it very well from where you are. Um, there's one category here called the micro-stable, um, and that is percentage of which people um, have followed in directly in parents' Footsteps. Okay, so what you can see here is that at the top, 17% uh, of British doctors at least have one parent uh, who is also a doctor. Okay, and you can see that stands out quite a lot from uh, the other categories here. Um, I suppose the main thing I want you to take away from this sort of general uh, slide here, though, is really the diversity of backgrounds in different elite occupations. Okay, from law, where, you know, if you take together the short range and the stable as people from professional and managerial backgrounds in general, nearly 65% of those in law come from these sorts of uh, privileged backgrounds. Um, and down here at the bottom, you have uh, public sector managers and professionals um, with a really much lower percentage of people coming from those sort of traditionally middle class backgrounds. But there's another story here. Um, that I want to just focus on. Um, we sort of think this table also sort of possibly suggests a telling distinction between the traditional and the technical to some extent. So you can see at the top that the sort of gentlemanly, what are sometimes known as the gentlemanly professions, okay, law, medicine, uh, finance, the media to some extent, um, contain a particularly high concentration here of those from privileged backgrounds. Whereas more technical occupations, particularly here interested in IT and engineering, appear at least to be much more open in terms of class origin. Certainly we know 
um, not so much in relation to gender, but in terms of class origin, uh, they appear to be. Just again, um, perhaps make this same data slightly easier to understand. Um, again, this is looking at the same statistics, but showing it in terms of how over or underrepresented these groups are in terms of the rest of the population. So these are all of these um, occupational groups. And you can see that in every elite group, the stable, okay, the red column, um, are somewhat represented. Each one of these red bars is over one, okay? But there's, again, a tremendous diversity um, among doctors. Uh, you know, this, the, the privileged are overrepresented by sort of over three times. Um, but that's much lower among public sector managers. So this is the sort of first research question here, demonstrating, I think, sort of wide variations, really, from for what's seen as in the um, sociological literature um, and also in the government's ONS classifications as a rel relatively coherent class, NSEC 1. There's actually a tremendous diversity in the openness of these different occupations. But what this analysis really can't tell us is how do these sorts of individuals who come from lower class origins actually fare relative to others when they're actually within these occupations? So what you can see in this next slide is how mean weekly earnings in Britain's top occupations vary according to one's class background. And here we've separated origins into all eight of the groups Okay, all eight of the individual class origins, uh, just to show you it a little bit more clearly. But the, <coughs> but the colours are still coded um, in the same way uh, as for the most of the analysis. It's also worth noting here that these slightly strange numbers on the uh, immediate left here represent logged earnings. Okay, and we use here the natural log of income because... As you can imagine, the meaning of money depends somewhat on how much money you're earning. So if you, uh, 100 pounds means significantly more to somebody earning 10,000 pounds than it does to somebody who's earning 100,000 pounds. And what, that's what sort of looking at logged income uh, really um, helps us to see. But I've also um, included the actual um, monetary figures um, up here uh, for your reference. And just to help you reading this slide, if you can't see it, um, you know, what this clearly demonstrates is that there are significant earnings differences according to social origin within NSEC 1. Uh, and in monetary terms, um, those from classes 6, 7 and 8, okay, from working class backgrounds, are earning about £145 a week less, which works out at over £7,000 a year. Uh, than those from privileged backgrounds, okay? Now, of course, a simple um, distribution of averages can't tell us whether the socially mobile are facing uh, a class ceiling, okay? It may be, for example, uh, that they are simply different to the stable in other respects, okay, that might explain this difference. So to interrogate this, uh, we conducted a, a series of regressions um, on earnings among people in higher professional and managerial employment. And specifically, we regress weekly earnings as our dependent variable here um, on origins, controlling for five sets of factors uh, that have been shown in lots of research to affect earnings. Um, and I want to just take you through those um, sets of controls just very quickly here so you know as we go along what, what we're actually talking about here. So first, we're controlling for demographics, okay, age, um, gender, um, ethnicity, although you'll note as we, go, uh, as we go along, one of the interesting things about looking at NSEC 1 in terms of wanting to do um, analysis in relation to ethnicity is that there is a very small um, sample of people in NSEC 1 who are from non-white backgrounds to, to such an extent as it hampers our ability to really say anything meaningful about ethnicity, which I will come to a bit later. So this is just a binary white or not white, which I understand is a 
quite problematic in sociological terms, but we are f- our hand is forced here methodologically. We also look at um, country of birth, we look at region, and we also look at hours worked, okay? How many hours um, a week do people actually work as a control? We then control for education, okay? Obviously very important in this sorts of debate. We look both at the level of your educational qualifications, and we also have an interesting measure for um, your degree class, okay? So we can see um, if there are differences by what actual uh, class of degree you get. We also control for human capital uh, in terms of health, job tenure, etc. cetera. Um, we also look at elements of work context, okay? And these are um, actually quite important, I think, in this instance. Um, we're looking at whether you work in a large firm or not, whether you work in the public or the private sector, what industry you work in. Um, And then very finally, we control using dummy variables for each of the 63 individual occupations. Okay? Now, what this does is obviously create a rather giant regression, okay, which I'm going to spare you in this table. Um, So what I want to sort of demonstrate in this table is really what happens to the class pay gap that I showed you um, that is just sort of earnings differences when we add each set of our controls. Okay, and just to note, these figures here are the exponentiated coefficient, which can really just be read for your purposes as a percentage. Okay, so versus people from privileged backgrounds, These people here from working class backgrounds, when we control for demographics, are earning about 80%, okay, 20% difference, 80% of what those from privileged backgrounds are earning, okay? And you can see the stars here are representing statistical significance. When we add uh, education, you can see this is doing quite a a lot of work here, okay? This is reducing the class pay gap. Um, considerably, but obviously it's not going away. Human capital doesn't really make any difference at all, um, which makes us somewhat happy because we're rather suspicious of human capital theories. Um, When we add work context, that has, uh, again, not a huge effect. And then finally, when we add specific occupation, again, that has a little bit of an effect. But I suppose what we really want you to sort of look at, really, in terms of the final model here, when all of the controls are added, there is a statistically significant class pay gap for nearly all ranges of social mobility. And the long range upwardly mobile are making only about 90% of what the privileged uh, are making, even when they are otherwise similar in all of these other regards. And to look at this in a very sort of simplistic way, but Um, As somebody who's not a sort of natural cons person, I find this sometimes just quite useful. This is simply in pounds per year, this is the difference in earnings um, when we add all controls um, in NSEC one job. So £6,000 a year. Okay, We think that is really quite a considerable amount of money and it's interesting to note um, that it is um, relatively similar, slightly less than the gender pay gap in the same data for the same set of occupations. I'll talk a little bit more about gender as we go. Um, So, what we can't do in this analysis is a sort of causal analysis. Um, But what we can do is conduct something very fancy called a blinder Oaxaca decomposition analysis. Um, I'm not going to sort of bore you with the details of how this uh, works beyond saying that what this really allows us to do is unravel some of the mechanisms um, that might be driving the class pay gap by actually comparing two groups. Okay, in this case, we separate um, because, as you saw before, the short range upwardly mobile are not statistically significant. We group together the other mobile groups and we compare them to those from privileged backgrounds. And what it does is it sees how 
much of the measured attributes of the upwardly immobile account for how much of the class pay gap. And what this chart basically tells us, if you just look at these two categories here, is that among the measured differences between the stable and the upwardly mobile um, accounts for about 44% of that difference, that pay gap, but 56% is still uh, unexplained. What we can also do, which is quite neat, just to give you a little bit more information about what's going on here, is to actually look at exactly what those drivers are, okay, in terms of that uh, 44%. So don't worry too much about <clears throat> these aspects. If you just look at the, in purple, percent of explained difference, um, what the um, negative 24, 25% here for age is actually telling us in column two um, is that actually the upwardly mobile are older on average than the stable within NSEC 1. And actually, if the average ages of the two groups were the same, the pay gap would actually be 25% larger. Okay, so obviously, if you are older in these top occupations, you tend to be earning more. And actually, in the data set we have, uh, the upwardly mo mo mobile are older. So if they were all the same age, it might be uh, even bigger, this pay gap. Education, on the other hand, um, tends to be doing quite a lot of work uh, in the other direction. Okay, So in general, in these NSEC 1 occupations, um, the stable tend to be better, in inverted commas, qualified Okay, in terms of educational qualifications. Now, we can talk a little bit about that, but I think possibly one way of reading that is about the fact that some of the occupations in NSEC 1 are sort of business-related occupations where, um, where it's actually possible to move up um, through the ranks without necessarily having um, uh, higher level qualifications. Um, but you can also see here that degree classification isn't doing much work, which I think is interesting. Um, human capital, not much to say there. Just to tell you a little bit about the work context, because I think that's also significant here in terms of the drivers of this pay gap. The two things I want to pull out here are work region, okay, the stable, those from privileged backgrounds, are more likely to work in London, where salaries tend to be higher. And they're also more likely to work in bigger firms, okay? Again, associated uh, with higher earnings. So I think for time reasons, I won't go into talking about each of these in depth. Hopefully we can perhaps pick them up in questions. But I suppose I want to stress, even with these drivers, even by doing this decomposition analysis, still over 50% of this pay gap seems to be unexplained, sociologically in terms of unraveling mechanisms. Now, while I've illustrated that the upwardly mobile face these pay penalties, I think it's important to deepen this and ask, does this disadvantage um, manifest as more marked for certain social groups within NSEC 1, okay, by gender, by ethnicity, by age, and then by individual occupational group. That's what I'm going to take you through quickly now. So first, in terms of ethnicity, um, you can see here that the overall pattern for ethnic minorities appears to be similar to that of whites, okay, the most disadvantage uh, for the long-range upwardly mobile. I'm just going to explain what this um, diagram is showing you here. Um, the points here are the coefficients, um, uh, the, the income origin coefficients, so similar to what you saw in the, last, um, in the last table. So that's indicating a percentage of what the stable in red are earning. Okay, and these wings are the confidence intervals. Okay, the thick line, the 95 the thin line, the 99% confidence intervals. And if these lines touch the one, okay, it's not statistically significant. Um, but as I said, what I want to flag here in terms of ethnicity is, again, that there aren't enough ethnic minorities in higher professional managerial occupations in the UK. In this data, only 311 in our entire sample with earnings data to have really any, I think, really sort of confident findings here. 
And obviously we know this is a very um, sort of blunt way of looking at ethnicity. Um, but without the sample size, it's really very difficult to pull apart what's happening. But to some extent, you might say this is showing you that there is somewhat of a difference um, if you are ethnic minority and you're also coming from a working class background that you may be suffering a slightly higher penalty. Um, gender is um, arguably a little bit more telling here. And there's a sort of two different storylines here. Um, the first is really that, as you can see from these coefficients, the men, um, diamonds, women are um, circles, that actually the sort of single effect of class origin is actually stronger for men than it is for women. But of course, women face a very clear double disadvantage, okay? a, di a disadvantage based on their gender and a disadvantage uh, based on... Um, their gender, uh, which is perhaps easier to see if we just show you basic uh, income data here. So what you can see is that the gradient is slightly higher among men in terms of their social origins, but to some extent sociologically we have to keep in mind the fact that this, when we compare women from working class backgrounds, to men from privileged backgrounds, we're talking about a huge uh, income difference, about £14,000 a year in these top occupations. Okay? And this is with uh, controls added. So, important to reiterate, we're not in any way trying to suggest here that the class pay gap is replacing uh, the gender pay gap, that it's more important than the glass ceiling. Um, Instead, I suppose we would very much want to highlight the intersections between class and gender here. Um, in terms of age, this is perhaps a little bit hard to read. Um, don't worry, I'm nearly at the end of the stats, okay? <laughs> Stay with me. Um, just to read this for you, if you find it a little bit hard to read the, the symbols here, pay penalties tend to be larger among older age groups. But this could mean two things in cross-sectional data, okay? We only have a snapshot here. It could be a good news story, okay? Class pay gap might be declining uh, across cohorts, okay? Or perhaps more plausibly, what this is showing us is that the greater penalties experienced by people in their 50s and 60s, okay, um, is a cumulative effect over the course of their career. Okay, but we can't really adjudicate between those two explanations because this isn't longitudinal data, this is only cross-sectional data. Um, what we also wanted to do is examine whether this idea of a class pay gap is uniform across those 16 occupational groups that I showed you earlier, or whether it's particularly marked in certain occupations. Okay, and what this figure shows you, again in terms of this same format, is how the pay gap varies with the base model, okay, with just demographic controls, and then with all controls added for each of those occupational groups. And here we are looking, again, at sort of anyone who's had really significant social mobility versus uh, people who are stable um, from privileged backgrounds. Um, again, Striking variation here at one end of the scale, um, and I think it's quite interesting to hone in on engineering, okay, seems to be, in terms of class origin, a sort of notable exemplar of meritocracy here. You'll notice from earlier on in the slide, relatively open, also doesn't seem to have a problem with class within the occupation in terms of people's progression. In contrast, you can see really, I think, the outlier here to some extent is finance, okay? Um, really large estimated annual class pay gap. And as my very last slide to sort of update you where this work's gone very recently, what we've tried to do is sort of follow up on this by looking at the relationship between space and occupation and actually hone in further um, on the relationship between region and sector in something like finance. And what this basically shows you um, 
very clearly is that to some extent the sort of apex of the class pay gap uh, in Britain um, is in central London, in basically the city. Okay, this is uh, people working in banking um, and finance in central London versus all other people in NSEC 1 in central London, banking and finance in the rest of the UK and top jobs in the rest of the UK. And this is for mid-range and long-range mobile and you can sort of see basically how there seems to be a strong uh, confluence of class origin inequality uh, in central London among those working in banking and finance. And here we are using what are called regional income percentiles to control for the fact that obviously the average incomes are also much higher. So there's higher variation. But even when you look at income percentiles within the regions, you see that this sort of, uh, this issue of how your class lingers and affects your progression seems to be particularly marked uh, in the city of London. Um, and it's worth saying, I mean, um, Jackie mentioned at the start, um, we've recently, I've recently got an ESRC grant um, to look much more closely at these, uh, at this sort of issue. Um, and really for me, the next step is to look at this stuff qualitatively. Um, so at the aim at the moment is to, is to conduct a series of case studies, occupational case studies, looking at the drivers of the class pay gap in particular arenas. So in finance, okay, why is it so marked in the city? We're going to look at um, a firm in the city of London. We're going to look at engineering because it seems to be the outlier here. Um, and we're also going to look at the culture and creative industries. Specifically, um, we've already had a look at uh, British actors, published some work on that, but we're also going to be looking at broadcasting, which is actually in NSEC 2 but seems to be another interesting sort of occupational arena where there are very strong class pay gaps. Um, so I can tell you a little bit more in questions if, you, if you're interested in that qualitative fieldwork. Okay. Um, of course, it's worth just, just sort of briefly telling you that there are obviously limitations to what we're doing here. Um, sample sizes for some of these really sort of minute and uh, very specific types of analysis is getting quite small. We have actually now pulled um, the new data from the 2015 LFS to um, sort of make sure that we are um, pulling in as much data as we can to look at these issues. And interestingly, uh, none of these effects really changes when you pull together and double the sample size. Um, but obviously, there is no longitudinal element, and that's another thing that we'd like to focus on to see, you know, at what point in the earnings trajectory is this pay gap opening up? Is there a ceiling effect? Um, you know, is it about the fact that people from working class origins just aren't getting onto the boards of big companies and that's skewing these effects? I think we really need to look longitudinally to see uh, where in the career trajectory these sorts of um, inequalities tend to open up. Um, and obviously, as I said, the qualitative is also all about trying to look at mechanisms, okay, why this might be taking place. Um, okay, I've bombarded you with lots of stats. Um, I just want to finish by um, summarising the main points again and then just uh, discussing some possible implications. So we find clear variation in the social composition of different elite occupations in the UK, particularly, as I said, between these sort of traditional... Uh, professions, um, medicine, law, which appear to remain dominated by uh, the privileged and what we might call a sort of technical elite, okay, particularly engineering and IT, which appear at least to recruit more widely. But even when the mobile are successful in entering many of Britain's most prestigious occupational arenas, um, they face, as I showed, this powerful class ceiling in terms of earnings. Um, and third, when we press even further to locate this pay gap uh, more precisely in sectoral and spatial terms, um, you see this distinct confluence of inequality in the city, basically. 
um, in London's financial sector. Um, I think there are two possible implications here for class analysis. I, this may be a little bit sort of um, um, specific to those interested in class analysis, but I hope they may uh, be interesting to you regardless. Um, I mean, from my point of view, one of the important things that this work really illustrates theoretically is that a person's uh, class destination, okay, where they end up in life, isn't really captured by the traditional tools of big class analysis or micro class analysis. Okay, big classes, as, a, as you've seen throughout this talk, simply hide too much pertinent information about what's going on within in terms of variation that's occupationally specific. But even micro classes are also not sufficient. For me, they, obviously they provide a more accurate indication. Okay, people in the same occupation are clearly closer in earnings and other resources than people in their wider macro class. But this sort of analysis still lacks information about intra-occupational position and crucially for our analysis, earnings. Okay, and how those earnings vary according to your origins. So our results, I suppose, suggest, to take this away from the abstract, that, for instance, a Glasgow lawyer earning £50,000 a year whose parents were factory workers are not really meaningfully in the same class in terms of their destination as a City of London lawyer earning £75,000 a year who was raised in a family of lawyers. So, provocative, but... That's our, our, our point here. So for us, a full understanding of class destination needs to take into account multiple indicators okay, of resources and social position. So one step in that direction is what we're trying to do here, looking at income and occupation in tandem. Second, and perhaps more significantly, what we think we've shown here is that existing social mobility research fails to really capture the persistent impact of a person's class origin in shaping their trajectories occupationally. Okay? It fails to grasp the stickiness of our class origins, the long shadow, as in Lillette, Annette Leroux has termed, uh, of our class origin. Now, to many of you, uh, if you are qualitative researchers, this might seem a slightly banal observation. Okay? We've Qualitative research for, you know, as long as it's been going has, has, has indicated to us that class identities tend to always carry, at least in some shape or form, the symbolic baggage of their past. But for us, in the dominant quantitative arena of social mobility analysis, this, this sensitivity to the linger of class is often absent. So in this regard, what we hope is that by drawing on the feminist concept of a glass ceiling, um, we might be sort of sharpening the tools of class analysis, providing a strategy with which researchers can begin, as we've done here, to interrogate uh, the hidden class barriers uh, within prestigious occupations and the ways in which fundamentally it pays to be privileged. Thank you.